Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Broadcast. We hope everyone is staying safe and staying well. We are pleased to have Sharon Celine and Julie Mensher here to talk about gender diversity and neurodiversity. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, you can visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 350, that's 350, to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater understanding of ADHD. Now for today's topic, with children and teens increasingly declaring a gender different than their sex assigned at birth, nothing short of a gender revolution is taking place. Parents are often left to play catch up with their children and teens who increasingly view gender as a spectrum, not a binary. For parents of kids living with ADHD, additional concerns about executive functioning challenges, like impulsivity, emotional dysregulation, planning, and focus, may further complicate the picture. In this webinar, Julie Mencher and Sharon Celine will discuss the fundamentals of understanding gender diversity and how ADHD affects the journey. Sharon is a clinical psychologist and author of the award-winning book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, Working Together to Empower Kids for Success in School and Life, and the ADHD Solution Card Deck. She spe specializes in working with children, teens, young adults, and families living with ADHD, learning disabilities, and mental health issues. Julie Mencher is a pioneer in gender diversity education psychotherapy and advocacy. As an internationally recognized speaker and consultant, Julie serves as a strategic advisor to organizations on gender diversity and sexuality. In her research and consultation practice, she has worked with over 100 independent schools, focusing on how these institutions can welcome and support trans students. You can ask questions of Sharon and Julie during their presentation, and we will get to as many of them as possible after they finish. So with all that being said, I'll turn it over to Sharon and Julie. Thanks so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Wayne, for that beautiful introduction. I'm Sharon. I'm Julie. And in addition to being colleagues, uh, in Northampton, Massachusetts, we're also good friends and we've shared a number of clients over the years. So it's a special treat to be here together to be ta and talking with you about this topic. So we'd like to start by sharing with you some of the questions we asked ourselves in advance of um, presenting and what kind of led us to create what we've created for you today. Julie? So I asked, is a child's gender identity path Im impacted by ADHD? And if so, how? So by that, I mean, how do many of the challenging features of neurodiversity, like inattention, learning differences, weaker executive functioning skills, impulsivity, and anxiety, do they, how do they confuse or obscure the child's struggle with gender exploration? And I also wonder, how can a parent tell if a child with ADHD who is also gender nonconforming is actually transgender? I had a few questions myself. I asked, how is a child's ADHD impacted by gender identity issues? How can a parent separate gender exploration from typical issues related to child or teen development? 
And how would you address a child's frustration with the slow, I can't see my hands here, so slow <laughs> pace of gender transitioning for kids with ADHD who want things to be different now? So let's get started. Next slide, please. Okay, first I want to say many thanks to Attitude and to Sharon for, for inviting me to be part of this. I myself am learning a lot about uh, ADHD and neurodiversity from Sharon. Um, it's not my area of specialty. Gender diversity is my area of specialty. And I started providing gender diversity training and consultation to colleges, healthcare organizations, schools, and camps about 20 years ago, in addition to doing therapy with trans clients and their families. Back then, I would never have predicted that we would be where we are today, with almost 6,000 parents, educators, and professionals signing up to learn more about supporting gender-creative kids. But 20 years later, nothing short of a cultural revolution is taking place around gender as we know it. We used to think gender was something crystal clear and neatly sorted into male and female. Indeed, the very first thing we knew about a child was it's a boy or it's a girl, but not anymore. We now live in a world where your kids can choose to identify themselves from over 70 gender categories on Facebook, where pop music icons like Miley Cyrus identify as gender fluid, where the common application for college gives high school seniors the option of naming a different gender identity than their biological sex. We now live in a world where many college classes begin with, my name is Julie and I go by she, her, hers, or they, them, their pronouns. Many parents and educators are left scratching our heads wondering how to address the changing gender landscape in our parenting and teaching. The transgender movement is the first social justice and diversity topic to come of age in the social media era. And as a result, the pace of public awareness and social change has been viral. The world has opened up tremendously for gender nonconforming kids in the past decade. And fortunately for them, they're more free to express their authentic selves. At the same time, kids are using gender as one more way to create their identities. So gender becomes more fluid and experimental to them. As parents, educators, and professionals, we need to educate ourselves like we're doing here today so we know how to support and connect with our kids while also managing our own confusion, biases, and struggles as we play catch up. In my time with you today, I'll be talking about the different paths kids take in their gender exploration. First, we'll go over some vocabulary to get us all on the same page. Next slide, please. So the first thing to know is that one's sex is different from one's gender. So let's start with the purple line on this slide, which says biological sex. This is the physical anatomy and biology that determines whether someone is male, female, or intersex. And for those of you who don't know, intersex people are the 2% of the population whose sex a doctor had a difficult time categorizing as either male or female at birth. They're, they're often described as having ambiguous genitalia. Gender identity, which is the top line, rainbow line, is how you think of and identify your own gender. It's your psychological concept of your gender. And gender identity is communicated to others through the yellow line, gender expression. It's how you demonstrate your gender through the ways you act, dress, behave, and interact. Everyone on this call is wearing our gender. Our glasses, our socks, our hair, the bags we carry, sometimes our cell phone cases are all gendered. Um, the bottom line, the orange line, sexual orientation, is another workshop entirely. It's who you're sexually, sexually attracted to based on their sex or gender in relation to your own. So most of us have been raised to believe that all of these components line up very nicely to each other. That if you have the physiology of someone born female, your gender identity will be woman, your gender expression will be feminine, and you'll be attracted to men. But they don't always line up. And for trans people, sex, gender identity, and gender expression don't line up. Can I have the next slide, please? 
cisgender people like me, for example, have a gender identity which matches their biological sex and gender expression and lines up with how they're read by others. In contrast, trans people, and I, I tend to use trans as the umbrella term to describe um, gender diverse people, not transgender. In contrast, trans people feel a disconnect between their biological sex and their gender, and that disconnect is what's described as gender dysphoria. So, so who are the gender creative kids? Mainstream media would have us all believe that trans kids are all like junior transsexuals who always knew they were born into the wrong body and who believe that their gender identity is opposite from the sex they were assigned at birth. But that's just a subset of trans kids. Next slide. In this slide, psychologist and gen gender expert Diane Aronsaf describes the full range of gender creative kids in three different categories. Gender non-conforming oranges, cross-gender identifying apples, and neither male nor female fruit salads. I personally don't love the fruit terminology, but so be it. I highly recommend her book, The Gender Creative Child, which is on the resource list you'll be receiving. Um, as we go through these slides, we need to keep in mind the difference between gender expression, how kids behave, and gender identity, how kids think of and label themselves. Next slide. Oranges, kids who are gender nonconforming in behavior, are the kids who used to be called sissies or tomboys, terms that have fallen out of favor. These kids go against customary gendered behavior in their play choices, dress, appearance, gestures, and choice of playmates. But they still think they're girls if they have girl parts, and they still think they're boys if they have boy parts. Even though their gender expression doesn't conform to cultural prescriptions of gender appropriate behavior, their gender identity remains aligned with their anatomy. Many, but not all of these children will end up to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, or queer. For them, their gender nonconforming behavior is a way to explore and express a non-heterosexual orient sexual orientation. Next. Apples, on the other hand, tend to persistently identify as the opposite sex from a young age. These cross-gender identifying kids see gender in very binary terms and feel like they were born into the wrong body. Parents are often shocked at how early the child shows some signs of gender transgression, even as toddlers or preschoolers. For example, a daughter who tantrums at the mere mention of wearing a dress, or a son who ties a dish towel around his head to simulate long hair, or a little girl who wants to stand up to pee like a boy. These kids feel a lot of anguish with the bodies they have particularly around the onset of puberty. Often the assigned male at birth apple says, I am a girl, not I wish I were a girl. And these kids are insistent, persistent, and consistent in identifying as the other gender as they grow up. Next. Fruit salads often have a non-binary identity, seeing themselves as neither male nor female, um, either as a, a gender, meaning without gender, both genders, neither gender, gender fluid. These are the kids who often drive the grown-ups crazy by insisting on going by they, them, their pronouns. This is a rapidly growing population, particularly among teens, who may call themselves gender queer, gender fluid, or agender. Childhood is one long process of creating a self and gender is a crucial part of that identity development process. So whether it's the four-year-old natal boy who always wants to wear a dress, or the 11-year-old natal girl who becomes profoundly depressed at the onset of puberty's physical changes, or the 15-year-old who proudly comes out as gender queer, we don't know at any one moment in time whether that child will turn out to be trans, or turn out to be non-binary, cisgender, or some other LGBTQ identity. As a therapist, parents often come to me asking me to tell them if their child is trans. I tell them that neither I nor they could possibly know, only time and your child will tell. 
Each child is on a gender journey. We just don't notice the gender conforming journeys among us. Some kids will veer off the con conventional gender path temporarily or permanently. As parents, it's our job to accompany our child on whatever their identity journey is. We have to listen to the child over time with openness and curiosity. Young children in particular won't encounter the language to describe what they're feeling inside about gender, unless this is something we talk to them about. We can let them know it's okay by bringing the topic of gender diversity into our family conversations, and Sharon's resource list offers you some help with this. At the same time, it's important that we avoid putting words into kids' mouths or prematurely categorizing them. When one of my clients, a six-year-old natal girl, complained that she feels different from all the girly girls in her class, her babysitter told her that that means she's transgender. And that's what my client proudly announced to her parents that night. An adult gave her a label before she had a chance to describe her own experience, which runs counter to giving her the freedom to find her own authentic sense of self. Kids can begin to experience a disconnect between their bodies and how they see their gender identity at any age, or between how they see themselves around gender and how others view them. So there can be years when parents are clueless that their kids might be struggling. And we know that the stakes are very high since gender creative kids who can't talk about it are among our most at risk children. We know that trans and gender nonconforming kids suffer tremendously higher rates of bullying, assault, suicidality, and family violence and alienation compared to cisgender youth. These kids are vulnerable, and yet with the right support, they often thrive. I worry much more about the trans kids we don't know about than the ones we do. If it indeed takes a village, you can be part of the support that they need. If your relationship with a gender creative child includes an open and safe invitation for them to talk about what is bothering them, you'll be way ahead of the game. If you meet them with curiosity and acceptance, even better. Research has shown that compassionate support from parents and schools is at the top of the list for what can protect these kids from negative mental health consequences. Thank you, Julie. That was so interesting. I actually have a question. Would you come back? Because I want to ask a question before I move sure. on to my part of the presentation. Um, could you define gender queer? Because you may have some other definitions, but that one wasn't one of them. And I don't want I want everyone to you know know what the terms are. Right. So if we go back to the notion of the uh, fruit salads, gender non-binary children. Um, gender queer is like another word for non-binary. It's a word that um, queer youth in particular have seized on as uh, the best description of how they locate themselves. So gender queer is another term for non-binary or neither male nor female. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and this also. Okay, so bear with me one second because we're switching. Uh, we're switching. Um, notes and uh, we're ready for the next slide. So, you know, Julie talked about the importance of describing our, you know, having ha teaching kids to describe their experience. And this is something that, of course, relates so profoundly to kids with ADHD. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with me and my work, one of the things I talk about a lot is how, what kind of name do we want the kids, kids with ADHD to give to their brains? Because ADHD is, is, is far from their experience as a label. You know, do they have fast brain? Do they have dreamy brain, foggy brain, uh, race car brain? Um, kids have ideas about this. Someone said it was a jumping jack brain. You know, we, and that helps them, I, uh, helps them own who they are. And that's part of what Julie's talking about. How are we going to help kids do that? So as a parent of a child with ADHD, you're accustomed to living with someone who thinks outside the box. Raising an alternative learner has depended on your flexibility, your compassion, and your patience. You're already parenting a child right now who is 
who has explored the idea of different intelligences and how that relates to them. And now your, your, your child is exploring how their gender relates to these same alternative ways of being. You've already, as a parent, learned a lot about ADHD, learning disabilities, high-functioning autism, twice-exceptional kids, and more. This website, this A Attitude magazine, is an incredible resource for our community around all things ADHD. Um, but you've already understood that. You're here. So you know what it is to help your child live their life more fully, express their talents, and manage school. You know how to stay open to and seek out information and people to assist you with their challenges. And this strategy of understanding, accepting, and adapting to ADHD can be directly applied to um, issues of gender diversity and gender exploration. We want to meet kids with ADHD where they are. We want to meet neurodiverse kids where they are. We want to meet kids who are in the process of gender exploration where they are. So this is 100% true for parenting kids in all these different areas. And perhaps you wanted a child you know, who had a different kind of brain, who didn't have ADHD, or didn't have dyslexia, who loved reading, who didn't have social anxiety, who made friends easily, maintained concentration consistently, and loved going to school every day. But your 13-year-old hates reading, prefers interacting with friends through gaming rather than seeing them in person, struggles with impulsivity and attention, and shuffles through school. Yet your child is very artistic, skilled at the drums, has a terrific sense of humor, and loves playing Frisbee. So while you have hopes and dreams for your child, you love your teen for who he is, who, who he is and, and you're, you're, you're more than, than you are more attached to their um, academic outcome. And it's a very similar process for accepting gender exploration. We're going to meet kids where they are and stay open to who they will become. Just like we're trying to meet our kids with ADHD where they are in terms of learning, emotional development, social skills, and stay open to who they're becoming. So one thing I wanna encourage you to do right off the bat is to forget about the parent report card. What other people think about your parenting is irrelevant. While comparisons may be a natural part of living in a community, as Teddy Roosevelt said, they are the thief of joy. Focus on what you're doing that's working and do more of that. It's easy when your child is going through you know, deep, deep periods of questioning who they are for you to feel like somehow you've done something wrong. No. Focus on what you're doing that's working and do more of that. Of course, there will be bumps and challenges. That's part of living. But we want to nurture a growth mindset in neurodiverse kids, regardless of their gender identity, who are naturally concrete thinkers and veer toward fixed mindsets. So as parents, we want to assist them in taking a risk, trying something, regrouping, learning from that, and trying again. Next slide, please. So these are two simultaneous journeys you're on. And I know you're thinking, oi, wasn't it enough that I had to, that we were dealing with ADHD or, or dyscalculia or troubles with written expression uh, or not being able to have friends? And now we're dealing with this. And you might feel like, what, ha what why, why? That is, I understand your feeling about that, but that actually isn't the, the, an effective question to ask. Because if you think you were on overload due to parenting ADHD before hearing that gender questioning or gender, or gender exploration was occurring, it gets more complicated now because of two parallel journeys. And your job isn't about solving anything. Your job is about being present. So it's typical for kids as they develop, particularly as they enter adolescence, to ask questions, who am I? Where do I belong? What matters to me? Kids with ADHD ask, who understands me? How do I understand myself? How can I accept my unique brain? This is a lifelong process of acceptance uh, uh, and exploration of self-worth. And um, 
kids are asking themselves, if I think differently and struggle with the executive functioning skills related to school that my peers aren't, you know, if I struggle with making friends and doing the tasks of daily living, how can I feel good about myself? So overcoming the shame and dealing with the challenge with the insecurity of neurodiversity is, of course, persistent. And now we're adding into that some of the shame, some of the insecurity and uh, around gender questioning. So um, these are our two, as I said, simultaneous journeys um, the, for kids whose executive functioning skills are already taxed by the responsibilities of daily living, who are easily distracted by screens or other, or, or other uh, social issues or homework. These are kids who are struggling to keep their heads above water. They're managing a lot of emotional stimulation and internal preoccupation with weaker executive functioning skills, particularly working memory and uh, processing speed. You know, um, I, I when I work, I worked with a, 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 ch a young girl cis, uh, who was cis uh, cis female. Which means she was she was nat uh, natal female and saw herself in the world as female, and she said to me, "You know, Doctor Sharon, I feel overwhelmed all the time." And I said, "Well, in what way?" And she said, "Well, it's like a file comes into my brain, and the papers go everywhere, and I start to pick up the papers, but then the next file comes into my brain, and those papers go everywhere, and then the next file comes into my brain, and I'm still working on the first file." And so when we think about kids who have ADHD and are exploring their gender or questioning their identity, we're now looking at kids who have a lot of files coming into the brain at the same time, and perhaps not particularly sophisticated skills at sorting and, you know, putting those papers in a place they belong. Um, so in addition to the anxiety that's typical for kids who, for many kids with ADHD, um, that's an anxiety that's related to typical gender questioning, we see a higher tendency among kids with ADHD who are gender questioning for emotional outbursts, withdrawal, and frustration at something other than the primary issue. And so our job as parents is to validate their situation without judgment or offering solutions. They need mirroring. They need to feel understood in this, you know, kind of wobbly place that they are. Parental response is critical in terms of mental health outcomes. Um, there's a lot of fragility for these kids under their bluster or avoidance. You know, 34% of kids with ADHD have a formal diagnosis of anxiety. Personally, myself and many of my colleagues in the ADHD world think that's a low number, but that's what the statistic is right now. And depression is somewhere between 16 and 30%. Typically, kids with ADHD have a higher suicide risk. They have higher rates of ideation and attempts. Um, but if we add in gender, uh, gender diversity and gender exploration, that stress increases their risk for trans. There's a much, there's a high risk for transgender adolescents and young adults associated with suicide attempts. And because kids with ADHD feel their feelings so intensely, you know, that tidal wave of emotion that takes over and because they often struggle with impulse control, your child, this means that kids with ADHD who are are facing um, and 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 um, ex and under trying to understand issues related to gender are are vulnerable. Next slide, please. So what what is your job as a parent? How can you be helpful? So we want to you know rely on. Um, of course, self-control. You're going to have a lot of thoughts and feelings about what's going on with your child and what they're going through. You, you, when you, you've raised your child in a certain way with expectations, unconscious or conscious, um, they need you to stay open and accepting um, and to give them a wide berth. So identify your triggers. What issues are the hardest for you right now with your, your gender questioning ADHD child? How can you regulate yourself in light of these intense um, triggers? Practice breathing exercises, go outside, listen to music, go to the bathroom if you're starting to lose it, uh, meditate. You want to build Im Im these emergency mindfulness tools by, by using them on a daily basis so that when you actually need to rely on them, it's not 
a shock. You know, you, it's not like, oh, I have to do that thing. It's like, of course, I'm going to do that thing. Research and figure out support systems to aid you in parenting a child in, a, in this complex journey and practice self-compassion as well as compassion for your child. This is a tough thing for you to go through as a parent. Very few people will understand what you're dealing with. Find someone who does. And of course, couples, if you're with a partner, will respond, may, will well, may well respond differently to what's going on and may have different levels of grief or joy or acceptance. We need to really be there for our partners as they go through their journey, just as we would like them to be there for us as we do. So we want to make space for different reactions while parenting on the same page. Please take time to think about how you're going to do this um, and also how you're going to um, include other family members. Next slide, please. So there are some key executive functioning skills that are impacted by, gen by gender identity exploration. And as I said, anxiety is something that many kids with ADHD live with. Uh, they hear from er early on in life what they should be doing, how they could be doing things better. And that creates a persistent hypervigilance about, you know, when am I going to do something, I miss the mark, not know I was actually missing the mark. And that, that there's a level of anxiety that can grow sometimes of course, into general anxiety disorder or social phobia or other kinds of anxiety. In terms of executive functioning skills, anxiety will affect all of them. Now, impulse control, uh, kids who are in the process of gender identity exploration will want to make changes now. And they have there's a huge frustration for waiting and moving through the complicated process of exploration or transition. Many kids have waited a long time to bring this up. And once they do, they're super eager to get started. I'm working with someone now named George. Uh, George um, has a history of depression and anxiety, as well as ADHD and dyslexia. George um, had to leave college after the first semester because George was failing. And George became extremely depressed was anxious um, and over time realized that George, um, which is, a, a, is not George's real name, George didn't want to live anymore in, as a female. George wanted to live as a male. And this was something that had been going on for George in the course of therapy in our exploration since George was about 12 or 13. But George didn't say anything to anyone until George was 19. And in the process of doing that, actually getting to see a physician starting on testosterone shots, and then after, of course, telling family and family members, there's a whole unfolding process here, which takes time. And for George, George just wanted, has wanted to start living more, more as a male, to being seen by a male as uh, from others, even though George feels that way inside. And... Um, and it's, it's a process. The medical system is complicated. George has been waiting, I think, six months to get uh, the, sh the, t the testosterone shots that were approved by the doctor because of insurance complications. And that has been, uh, that's been depressing. George sunk into another depression this winter and is just coming out. Um, so there's a lot of hurry up and wait, and uh, we'll see kids act out verbally or behaviorally in the process. So we want to provide them with information about average waiting times and to assist them in the areas of inter intervening with systems like medical systems or educational systems uh, where they're struggling. Of course, emotional regulation, dysregulation is another challenge for uh, people with ADHD, and uh, this is a deeply emotional and personal process for brains that are already easily flooded. We want to slow things down when our kids are overwhelmed for them and for ourselves. And of course, um, anxiety about ADHD will add to the, whatever anxiety that these kids are feeling about their gender, and this can feel unmanageable to them. We know that untreated anxiety will lead to depression. So we want to really make sure that kids are getting the support they need. 
in terms of organization, gender transitioning, gender questioning requires organization and understanding of complex medical and insurance systems that might be too much for your teen to handle at this point. Ask how you can assist them while normalizing that these areas are tough for all young adults. Use lists, use calendars, you help them map out what their path might be in terms of who to see, when to see them, and what to say. A lot of kids don't exactly know how to navigate these systems or how to stand up for themselves. And this sort of leads into planning and prioritizing. Offer assistance for making med medical appointments or ther finding a therapist, uh, deconstructing rules and insurance regulations about medication for my client. One of the things that happened is that the endocrinologist prescribed um, a particular um, testosterone shot that was $400 of a copay. That's a lot of money for him. And there was a whole process of having to go back to the physician and get a different kind of medication. Um, it would have probably been easier if he had engaged help from one of his uh, parents you know, earlier on. We want to work together with our kids to set up systems so that they that things sort of follow step by step, and they're not trying to do it all from that, that place of those overwhelming files. Um, and a lot of times we know for kids with ADHD, they can do a brain dump, but they can't really order the things or figure out, you know, what should I start with? And, the, and you as a parent can help them with that. You can help them sort of understand the difference between urgency, which is a crisis, I need to do it right now, it's a time issue, and value, which is, which is related to importance. So we want to help them understand urgency and importance. And finally, focus. Kids with ADHD, of course, often hyper-focus on topics of interest or importance to them. This target is now their gender, and they can be a like, little bit like a dog with a bone. There's nothing else. That's all they're focusing on, all they want to talk about. Together, you want to zoom out in their lives and create a balanced focus, create a plan um, to help them break tasks down into doable steps with a timeline that will assist them in gaining some perspective. And we want to normalize this process. You know, yes, of course you want it to happen quickly. What can we do to get things moving? Next slide, please. And finally, you know, the goal for you as a parent here is to listen. Start by hearing words, reading body signals, use reflective listening because these kids need to feel seen and heard. Meet your child where they are in terms of learning, behavior and emotion about neurodiversity, gender identity and other issues. Use your empathy instead of worrying, wonder. Think about how brave your child has been to own this for themselves and share this discovery with you and others. Um, being met with standards of so-called normativity can leave them feeling inadequate and alienated. Now, of course, as a parent, you want to protect your child. You know, you want your child not to encourage pain or struggle in the world. Um, that's a natural inclination, but your child's path is your child's. And so, um, your child, uh, you may feel like your child is now more at risk for not getting their needs met in the world. And you might want to help them in ways that they don't <laughs> use useful, as useful. Um, so for these kids, we want to collaborate. This is especially important. Of course, we know collaboration is key for kids with ADHD, but it's especially important for kids who are living with ADHD and um, exploring gender. Uh, diversity. Um, avoid you should or why don't you and shift to how can I assist you? What is your desired goal? Do you want to talk with me about how to get there? Um, we want to focus on resilience. Resilience is the antidote to anxiety. How, did, how have you met other challenges in your life, parent? And how have you met other challenges in your life, child? And how do we link the, the approach that you took to those challenges and the ways that you overcame them to what's going on right now? And then I want you to think about celebration, that positive to negativity ratio. Ideally, it should be three to one. How are you expressing your support of your child along these parallel journeys? What do you want your focus to be? We want to love and validate them for who they are. Next slide, please. 
So let's go back to our initial questions for discussion. Um, um, Julie, what was your question? My question was, is a child's gender identity path impacted by ADHD? And if so, how? And my question is, how is a child's ADHD impacted by gen gender issues? So it looks to me like we have a number of questions, uh, Wayne. Yes. Uh, so, you know, we, we, Julie and I also have a, 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 a client that we share, which we could launch into, but I'm thinking we should maybe go into the questions. What do you yes. think? Yes. Yeah, we had a lot of great questions, so let's do that. Wonderful. Um, one parent writes, my concern is that my child gets most information on trans identity from online chat rooms and refuses to have a rational conversation about it with me or anyone else. How do you suggest encouraging a discussion outside of an online chat room? Such a good question. And it's been both a blessing and a curse to the trans community that uh, trans people who don't have access to other trans role models in their lives or don't, or don't have access to trans peers in their lives, they go online and they find their community there. And that can become kind of a, a bubble for them and a way that makes them separate from the other people in their lives. And obviously that is, has some overlap with neurodiversity as well. So what I would suggest is that you do things like watch a video together as a family about gender diversity. There's an excellent um, documentary done by Katie Couric uh, National Geographic, um, and it's on your resource list, and that can be a launching pad for discussion about the topic in general. I would also look at other resources on, on the resource list, like Gender, Gender Spectrum, which is an organization that runs online professionally-led groups for parents of trans kids and for trans kids themselves. So I would try to help curate a little bit what your child is um, learning and add resources to it rather than try and take away their cherished resources. What do you think about therapy though? I mean, I think that if someone is is not really talking to a parent about it, I'm, I, I as a parent would feel better if I knew my child was talking to someone who was a professional who knew, who, who specialized in this area. And, you know, I think it's going to be hard to find someone who specializes in ADHD and mm -hmm. um, gender diversity. Um, so you might need to, you know, you might need to have a coach or a therapist for that and then something for, for this. What right. do you think? I think therapy can be a really vital resource um, to kids who don't want to process their gender identity journey with their parents. And it's really important to find a good, a good qualified gender specialist therapist and one that subscribes to a philosophy of letting the child's gender identity unfold over time rather than one that is more prescriptive in terms of gender identity. But the case that we were going to talk about, which maybe we won't have time to talk about, was a very important example of how this was a young person in therapy with me, a gender specialist, to talk about gender identity development. But I began to see some neurodiversity concerns when that client went to grad school, and I referred to Sharon for adjunct work around the neurodiversity, and then that client also allowed us to speak with each other and collaborate. And it was interesting because uh, we, for me, my work a lot with the client, we, I, I definitely include some um, gender, gender diversity issues or transgender issues in this case. So this person is living as a female um, and um, identifies as a female um, and, and to talk about that. And I also did family therapy, which isn't we, you know, typically, well, what? I did family therapy. You with, did. We, with both, we both did family <laughs> therapy. Mm -hmm. um, two, different two different perspectives that uh, was very interesting. Yeah. Okay, that was good. I, I, several people have asked that. Should I go with separate therapists or coaches? Uh, because they're having trouble, first of all, finding one who is uh, skilled in both um, gender identity and ADHD. And second, 
uh, long waiting lists for gender identity therapists. Yeah. So any any help on that front in terms yeah. of finding, uh, is, is there a, a place they can go to find them? Well, one of the, um, I think, enduring uh, silver linings of this horrible past 13 months um, will be that insurance companies are increasingly paying for telehealth. So if you can't find a gender specialist and ADHD specialist in one package in your area, you can try to find that outside of your area. But also this is the type of client who also, who often has two helpers, two professional helpers to deal with these two different aspects. Um, there are uh, gender diversity institutes like the Ackerman Family Institute in New York um, that specialize in uh, gender creative children and their families. And those would be good resources for finding therapy referrals. Right. Um, one mom asks, how do you help a four-year-old whose parents are in disagreement with how to address his identity as a girl? I would imagine there's, you know, this is fairly common that the spouses aren't in total agreement. Yeah, it's very common. And one of the most most challenging post-divorce therapies I ever did uh, was with a couple where one mom um, uh, was sure that her child was transgender and the other mom was sure that her child was cisgender. And they actually called the child by different names and used different pronouns with a six-year-old child. Hmm. So that is an extreme situation that nobody wants to have happen in their own family network. Mm -hmm. um, with a child that young, I would include the child in the therapy, but the main work is with the parents. And so right. I would work um, with the parents on seeing where the common ground is, where they can come from a united perspective with the child, because, you know, the confusion of the child doesn't need to become the exacerbated by the mixed messages of both parents. You know, it's so interesting because that's so true for ADHD too, you know, mm -hmm. where a parent will say, I, I think my child has this and I want to go ahead and do medication. And another parent will right. say, oh, I don't think it's such a big deal. I was like that. I turned out fine. And this idea, this is again, that two simultaneous journeys thing where basically what we're talking about is parenting on the same page, not necessarily because you know, ideally, you'd want to collaborate with your partner, but mostly because you put the importance of get, being uh, on the same page for your child above all else. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the thing that really mm -hmm. you can work on. Right. Are there any studies that you two are aware of um, um, suggesting that there's a higher correlation between um, gender identity exploration and... Um, and ADHD or autism, anything you're aware of there? Yes, there are a number of studies between um, autism and gender identity. Uh, there were one or two studies uh, that I found that sort of put um, ADHD in the same kind of basket as, as autism spectrum disorders, but didn't identify it individually. So mm -hmm. um, I think there are studies, and a lot of them are around you know, in the field of neurodiversity, but specifically on, on the, for kids on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's um, also a lot of anecdotal evidence that led to those studies. So a lot of therapists have noticed that kids on the autism spectrum tend to represent in proportionally higher numbers than kids than neurotypical kids. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a good and tough question. How do you help an ADHD teen who has recently announced a change in their gender and wants to inform grandparents who are extremely against gender exploration because of religious concerns? But I've also gotten some questions here just because they're of a different generation and don't understand, mm -hmm. in some cases, what might be going on. Well, you know, one thing I want to say is, you know, part of the task of, of being a teenager is asking yourself, who am I? 
Where do I belong? What's most important to me? And if, you know, in that process, one of the things that you uncover or you spend time focusing on is your gender identity, you, of course, want to share that. Um, the question is how and what is, to me, you know, what is the point of sharing it with people and wh what support are you going to get around their reactions? So it's about, it's, it's really a family issue at this point, not just an individual issue, because the family has, the, the primary family unit has to be united um, in a way uh, uh, up against some of this pushback and negativity they're going to get from, you know, relatives or other people in society. And I'm really interested in what you have to say about that. So this would be an excellent discussion or set of discussions to take place in the therapist's office um, where you have a third party rather than the teen and the parents going at it around this. The danger is that the teen will see the parent's protectiveness around being reluctant to share the child's gender identity with grandparents, not as protective, but as critical. Mm -hmm. So the teen is likely to say, you just don't want me to be trans. You just think it's a stage I'm going through and you're just waiting for that stage to pass. And that's why you don't want me to tell grandma and grandpa about this. And so it requires some finesse for the parents to say, we accept you as trans. We, ex we, we support you as trans. But part of that support as your parents is to protect you from people who aren't going to be as supportive. And so we want to go through a process with you of really understanding how much information you want to share, needs to be shared in order for you to feel comfortable and to help you prepare for possible negative reactions that you might get in response. Um, ideally, I would work with parents separately to coach them on what to say to their teen about this and also work with the teen to say, what is it you want to get out of telling your grandparents? What would it be like for you to go see your grandparents and have them not know? And what would it be like for you to go see your grandparents and have them know? A lot of times teens need some help from the parents in envisioning how they could possibly have an ongoing relationship with extended family if they don't know. You know, one thing that happened with my client that I talked about, George, uh, George um, has divorced parents and um, one of his mothers wanted, really wanted George to tell an elderly aunt. And George was very uncomfortable with telling the elderly aunt. And the mother felt that it was important that the elderly aunt know because, you know, she's elderly and she's going to die and she really loves George. And this was a this was an issue that I was dealing with in the family work that I was doing with his family because um, George was not ready. And George really needed support from me to say, slow down. This is George's call. Right. Right. So it, this is a related this is a related Anecdote. It's the other, right. the other side, yeah. Well, those were all interesting points. Very, very interesting, really. Um, uh, this is another mom. My daughter has ADHD. She is also she also has a very obsessive personality and latches on to things she wants and doesn't let go of them. She never showed any signs of being transgender until she hit puberty. How can I tell that? if this is, isn't one more obsession or is it the true thing? Well, I just want to say one thing in term, from the ADHD perspective, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's an, another obsession or something different. We need to take it at its face value um, because this is part of her process of unfolding. And, and that's really important. And I know for parents of kids with ADHD, it's exhausting because there's always something that becomes this sort of, that what I said earlier, that kind of dog with a bone. Oh, this is the issue. This is the issue. I need to focus on this issue. And, and, that, and we want to say, oh, not again. This will pass too. But that's actually, we don't know. And since we don't really know and we're standing in insecurity, we want to meet them where they are. I'm so glad that, that you said that and that we're starting with that. Where the rubber meets the road on that, though, is when the teenager's obsession, possible obsession, possible authentic identity development around um, self-identifying as trans 
begins to um, result in a request for medical intervention. And this is the place where parents mm -hmm. get really stuck because yeah. it's like, if it's ADHD obsessiveness, mm -hmm. I can meet her where she's at, but what about if she's bugging me constantly for hormone intervention or for surgery mm -hmm. for changes that may not be reversible? What do I do about that? And so that is a you know, really profound and poignant moment in my work with parents to help them kind of slow down the medical intervention while also taking the child seriously. Now, one thing that I think we, we keep coming back to is that it is really important for parents for you to get a family support. That this mm -hmm. is this is a big issue, and it's not something that really you know you want to handle on your own. And I agree with Julie that there's a lot of accessible resources now because of the internet, and because a lot of people are doing coaching or telehealth. Um, so you do want to find someone who feels like a good fit and who can un can understand your family dynamic, because you can always get information, but you can't necessarily you know work on that dynamic in light of all of this important stuff. And I'd like to add something to that, which is um, if I'm, if I'm the parent of a, a, a young teen with ADHD and um, going through a gender exploring process, I, you know, I have two sisters. I talk to them about everything. So I might want to talk to them about this. They may be my go-to people on all things parenting related but do I want to out my child in terms of my child's gender exploration? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to choose carefully who are the adults in my life I'm going to talk to. They may not be the usual candidates. Mm -hmm. Very you good point. Your child's privacy. And that's a thing that's hard sometimes when you're having a hard time as a parent. You're like, I don't know what to do. I need to talk to somebody and you're not, you don't, you're not aware. I mean, I, I've made this mistake a few times with one of, with one of my children that to someone else and I didn't actually get her permission. And so that's, it's a really, because I needed the support and that she felt violated. And I think that's not, obviously that's not what we want to do as parents. Mm hmm any, I know you brought up the video before, but several parents have asked any suggestions for how to start a conversation with an adolescent who's exploring gender identity, or should they just sort of back off and let the child come to them? I don't know. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a really tricky question, because if you just kind of take a wait and see attitude and let the child come to you, you may not have conveyed enough of an invitation to the child to come to you around this topic in particular. So it speaks to how all parents should actually be thinking about what it is to be a gender progressive parent, what it is to be a gender inclusive parent, whether or not their kids um, are actively engaged in gender exploration. But I would say things like go a little kind of soft pedal it a little bit in terms of saying, I've noticed that you've started wearing different colors recently. Like, is, you know, is that because of anything in particular? Or you, have you just changed your favorite colors? Like, or I've noticed this or that. So, so pick up on the behavior and meet it with curiosity with your child mm -hmm. and, and ask about it. Right. And that true for ADHD too. You know, I'm, I'm, it's very important when you sit down and you want to work on an executive functioning skill or particular behavior with a child that you don't say, why are you doing this? You know, mm -hmm. but you say, hmm, I notice, or I'm wondering, or I've seen that. Oh, that's a conversation opener rather than a sort of more direct provocative question, which can be a conversation closer. I also think sometimes gender exploring kids kind of float the topic by talking about friend, friends of theirs um, who are gender exploring or, and, and if you respond to that within, with acceptance and inclusivity, it gives them the message it's okay to talk about this. Right. Well, I, that's an excellent point. Uh, I love that advice. Um, the hour's up. 
So thanks so much for being here and sharing your expertise. It really was excellent, very clarifying and insightful. Thank you for having us. And I want to just make sh remind everyone to go to uh, click the links for the uh, the risk handout. Um, there, we spent a lot of time putting this together, and I think there's something for everybody. That's great. That's a great reminder. And I just wanted to thank all of the attendees for joining us. Please join us next week on April 21st when Stephen Becker will talk about the latest science on improving sleep in children and teens with ADHD. And make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, ADHD expert articles, or important research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. And thanks everyone for being here and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you so much.